It's time for oral questions. The leader of uh, no, the no. member for Redford, Nipissing Pepper. Oh, my goodness. Promotion, promotions all around. It must be Christmas. You, you had me surprised there. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My, que my question is to the Minister of Energy. Minister, as we get closer to winter and temperatures drop, the consequences of your irresponsible hydro policies become more apparent and dire. All across Ontario, people are, have to face the hard choice between paying their hydro bills or going without other essentials. This is because they are paying 14 cents a kilowatt hour plus debt retirement charge, HST, and delivery charges. Ratepayers are paying. When you entered office, ratepayers were paying a competitive 4.3 cents a kilowatt hour. If you don't change your course, Ontarians who are struggling to pay their hydro bills today will soon be forced out of their homes and left in most desperate conditions. Minister, will you finally address the reality of the failure of energy policy, your energy policies, and stop these unaffordable increases? The Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, for the last 10 years, this party and this government has been taking tremendous efforts to create affordability, reliability, and clean energy in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, when we took over government 10 years ago, there were a deficit of electricity. They were expanding dirty coal, Mr. Speaker, to the point where it was 25 percent, Mr. Speaker, and they had double-digit increases in the rates when they tried to privatize the electricity system. Mr. Speaker, we've invested tremendously in the energy sector to make it reliable, to make it affordable, to make it clean, Mr. Speaker. And I'm happy in the supplementaries to deal with the specifics. Supplementary? Minister, you know that the primary reason for skyrocketing hydro bills is because of your Green Energy Act and the expensive contract, contracts you've signed under it for unreliable intermittent energy. On November 24th, wind turbines were cranking out a ton of expensive power we didn't need. We had to sell that power at a loss. We sold it to Michigan, New York, and Quebec at a loss of $10 million. That's $10 million for a single day. Speaker, Steve Austin was the $6 million man. You're the $10 million a day man. How, how do you explain to the small business or the seniors struggling with their back up against the wall, how do you explain to them how we can blow $10 million a day and it's right on their hydro bills. How do we explain to that to them? Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I know that the uh, that the uh, critic for the Conservatives understands the electricity system a little more than he's letting on, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, he's feigning ignorance uh, in terms of uh, well, the electricity system. It. He knows, Mr. Speaker, that we have a surplus when they left us with a deficit of electricity. Yeah. That surplus is being used, Mr. Speaker, to help the ratepayer and to reduce rates. We're doing that in a number of ways, Mr. Speaker. One of the ways we're doing it is by creating the Industrial Electricity Incentive Program, program. which represents about a 50 50 percent reduction in electricity rates for new companies coming into Ontario and for those who are expanding, Mr. Speaker. We are taking significant steps, Mr. Speaker. He also knows that on the sale, the trade of electricity, that we are saving, saving costs to the Answer. taxpayer by exporting our electricity, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, critics of your government policies have said time and time again. As new, intermittent, expensive, unreliable energy comes online, we will have to sell more power at a loss to our competitors at times when we don't need it. When our electrical system is flooded with wind power, ratepayers have to pay Bruce Nuclear to release steam from, from their plants, reducing the output from their plants. When we're flooded with wind power, you have to let gas plants stand idle. Ratepayers have to foot all of the bills for that. They pay for your mistakes. Ratepayers you know that at peak, uh, at peak and off-peak hydro rates, as they rise, Ontario ratepayers get hit harder and harder and harder. Minister, what are you prepared to do to ensure that Ontario has no more $10 million days so you can stop being the $10 million man? Question. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the member knows that renewable energy 
consist of about 8 per cent of our total energy supply. Mr. Speaker, that has a marginal increase in prices, and to attribute it to renewable energy Mr. Speaker, is very disingenuous, to, to borrow a phrase from the uh, uh, from the member from Eastern Ontario, uh, but Mr. Speaker, uh, I would refer the member to an article in the New York Times about four or five days ago, Mr. Speaker, where they uh, spoke about a study by Lazard Investment Firm, which is a very credible, large investment firm, where they have itemized across North America, Mr. Speaker, how energy prices are coming down for renewable. In U.S. states, Mr. Speaker, the renewables are now parity at grid. In other words, Conrad wind and solar, Mr. Speaker, are not and costing sir? more than anywhere else. And the current uh, procurement process we're going through, I met with the industry uh, about uh, five or six days ago, Mr. Speaker. They are now almost approaching parity at grid. Moving Thank forward, you. it will be as cheap as gas, Thank and it will be cleaner than gas. And that's because we have a smart. Order. New question. The member for Oxford. Thank you much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister, it's been almost a year since the ice storm, and municipalities are still waiting for emergency assistance. It took you nine months to write an application so municipalities could apply for the ice storm funding. Another two months to give them. Uh, it took another two months to give them training on the applications, and then two weeks later, according to the Toronto Star, you're blaming municipalities for not having their applications in. Who is really at fault here, Minister? The municipalities or you? Oh, I think it's the latter. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, let, me, uh, let me take a moment, uh, Mr. Speaker, to, uh, to say that I uh, was amongst uh, a, a large number of Ontarians who experienced the ice storm. Our power in our place was out, I think, for six days. And I have nothing but uh, admiration and respect for municipalities and the first responders who responded so well uh, to the emergency that befell large parts of Ontario. Remarkable. Um, in, in, in that regard, our government took the unprecedented uh, step of uh, supplying up to $190 million based on a municipalities uh, uh, requiring money over and above their budget and also related to health and safety concerns directly Answer. to the ice storm. Municipalities are processing the applications. We're helping them in every way we can, and I'm pleased to, pleased to say that things are coming along quite well. That's good. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, if you can't get the smallest of the claims out, how long is it going to take you to get process these thousand the claims that are a thousand um, higher? Um, now, the, according to the press, the claim from Toronto is going to be 2,000 times higher than the claim that's already in your office um, waiting for approval. Have you approved that claim yet? Has any of that money gone out to the municipalities yet? We were told last week that, in fact, you had one application in. Have they actually got their money yet, Mr. Uh, Minister? Minister? <clears throat> well, I appreciate that, uh, that question from my honourable opponent. Uh, who speaks uh, quite frequently about government accountability. I know in a similar situation when they were in government, uh, they shoveled money out the door, and when they applied to the feds to get the money back, the feds said, no, we're not about to replicate that uh, situation. Here's what your former leader, oh. here's what your former leader, John Tory, and the current mayor of the largest municipality in Ontario said, and I quote, the applications are just about complete. They, bracket staff, are having no trouble putting them together, and they are going to be submitted on time. The deadline is Answer. what it is, and I'm told the applications will be in on time, and they are not having any trouble with them. Wow. So when the largest municipality and one of the smaller ones Thank you. Uh, Maple Hurt, Mapleton uh, can complete them. Supplementary. We're, we're well on track. That's good news. Minister, it's clear that someone has messed up. 
It's a year after the ice storm, and only 23,000 of the $190 million in emergency assistance is actually, um, according to you, gone out, which would be that small municipality. Now that you found out that the program is so bad, some municipalities are considering giving up on their applications. Are you going to penalize the American or the Alberta company that you hired for almost three million dollars to help you deliver this program? Are you going to penalize them for this delay, or in fact, are you going to accept that they're doing their job, but you're not? Mr. Oh. Well, we're doing the job, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there are accountability provisions that are in place. Uh, much of that is governed by the federal process. And by the way, we weren't just last Friday. We weren't just last Friday because of the uh, provisions we put in place around accountability that the feds are actually going to partner with Ontario in terms of assisting. So I think that's good news. We'll continue to work with municipalities. They asked for some additional time and some additional help. And guess what? We extended the deadlines because some of them had not even calculated the full cost by the end of August. So we have extended the deadline and we provided some assistance to them. We're on track for December 31st, and I'm pleased to say that, uh, that I think things uh, uh, very soon will work out very well. Thanks. Thank you. New question, the, the leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. In hundreds of schools and clinics across this province, public health units provide basic teeth cleaning and checkups to low-income children. But New Democrats found out that Liberals are quietly cutting preventative dental care for kids by cutting this service from the Ontario Public Health Standards. Toronto's Medi Medical Officer of Health says that 80 per cent of children who received oral health care are going to lose it. The Premier has said she is, quote, not going to cut health care, Speaker. Can she explain why she is, in fact, doing just that and cutting dental care for thousands and thousands of vulnerable children across this province? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So here is uh, here's the reality of what we're doing. We are in the process, Mr. Speaker, of combining six different programs. And uh, as you look at the uh, the programs that were in place, Mr. Speaker, in fact, the money that was allocated to those programs was not all being spent, Mr. Speaker. It wasn't being used in the way that it was intended to be used. Uh, in 2013-14, the funding for the Healthy Smiles program was $30 million, and as of April 1, 2014, 70,000 more children from low-income families can now access dental services, Mr. Speaker. So the changes that we are making are designed to help more kids whose families cannot afford dental services to get those dental services, Mr. Speaker. We are combining six programs. It is a change. I know that the leader and of the sir? third party is not keen on change of any kind, but this change is going to mean that more kids from low-income families <laughs> will get dental services, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Well, that is simply not the case, and this Premier knows it. She and her minister have insisted all along that health care is not being cut. Well, we've watched the Liberals cut health care time and time again. But the Liberals are secretly cutting dental care for the most vulnerable children. Speaker, 15,000 children in Toronto will lose dental care. That's a cut. News to Premier. That's a cut. 15,000 children. According to Northwestern Health Unit, of the 4,000 children who received pre preventative dental care services last year, 98 per cent of them are going to lose that service, Speaker. That is a cut. Of those 4,000 kids who received, uh, received care last year, only 80 per cent uh, will receive, rather, only 80 kids, 4,000, only 80 kids are going to be getting that service. New Democrats believe that children should have Question. a healthy smile, Speaker, not rotting teeth. The Liberals used to believe that at one time, too, Speaker. Will the Premier stop these cuts and make sure these kids get their services? Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker. The reason, the reason that we are making the changes that we are, the reason we're taking six programs, Mr. Speaker, where kids were not accessing the services that they needed and combining those into one program, Mr. Speaker, is because we believe that more kids from low-income families should have access to dental services. So as of April 1, 2014, 70,000 more children from low-income families have access to dental services, Mr. Speaker. 
If there is a particular issue in a particular program in a particular municipality, I know that the Minister of Health would like to know about that, Mr. Speaker. But overall, the funding has not changed. The programs have been consolidated, and more children are receiving dental care. More children from low-income families are getting that dental care that they need, Mr. Speaker. Your final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Premier can drink her own bathwater all she wants, but the Toronto Board of Health has asked the Liberals to stop the these cuts. The Northwestern Health Unit has asked the Liberals to stop these cuts. The Association of Local Public Health Units or Health Agencies has asked the Liberals to stop these cuts. The Premier is the only one that's saying that there are no cuts to kids. Everybody else is admitting that, in fact, low-income kids are going to have their services cut. This Premier should, should admit to the people of Ontario exactly what she's doing. So now I ask her the question, will she actually do the right thing and stop these unprecedented preventative health care cuts, dental care cuts from being cut from the people, from the lowest income, most vulnerable children in our province. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the $30 million that is in the Healthy Smiles program is there. It has not been cut, Mr. Speaker. That money is available. And what we have done, Mr. Speaker, is we have integrated six programs. If, as I said, there is a specific case where there has been a change that has had an unintended consequence, we would want to know about that and we would want to know the specifics. But, Mr. Speaker, 70,000 more kids from low-income families are receiving dental care because of the changes that we are making, Mr. Speaker, and I think that that is a good thing. We are working so that more children will have that dental care, and that will make them healthier, Mr. Speaker. That is the full and the primary reason that we are making these changes, so that more kids will have Thank access sir. to dental care. Thank you. New question. Speaker, my next question is also for the Premier. As the session closes this week, the cynicism and arrogance of this Liberal government continues to grow, and we just saw it again with that Premier's answer. The government insists people aren't being hurt by health care cuts, Speaker, but cutting nurses and cutting access to home care actually hurts people. And now it's cutting dental care for low-income children. Will the Premier admit that her government is cutting health care and that, in fact, people and children are being hurt? Premier. Mr. Speaker. We are working very hard on this side of the House to make changes that are necessary to transform the health care system so that people get the service that they need. Whether it's low-income kids who can't access dental care or whether it is people in their homes who need service, Mr. Speaker, we are increasing funding to make sure that that happens. The reality is that there is change needed. There's change needed whether it's the integration of the six dental care programs or whether it's access more service for people in the communities. Those are changes that are necessary. We are making those changes, Mr. Speaker, and we are increasing funding in health care, Mr. Speaker, not reducing it. Thank you. Supplementary. Here, the people of Ontario want their government to make changes that make their lives better, not make their lives worse. Uh -huh. And it's not just cuts to health care, Speaker. This government insisted that it was being open and transparent, but the Liberals keep calling our keep so-called transparency report on auto in the auto insurance industry hidden. And the Liberals are protecting Liberal insiders still in the $1.1 billion gas plant scandal. How long can this Premier continue to insist that she is being open and transparent when the evidence shows to the contrary time and time again? Premier. Just picking up the thread from that first question, Mr. Speaker. Um, the reality is that the report to, to which the, uh, the leader of the third party refers is a report that will be made available, Mr. Speaker. We have uh, said that all along. We have been very clear about the, uh, the challenges in front of us, Mr. Speaker, and we've been very clear that we do need to make changes. You know, when there are six programs that are in place to allow uh, kids to have access to dental care, if the resources aren't being spent, if the money's not being spent on that, Mr. Speaker, and the kids who most 
most need the dental care are not getting that dental care, then I think a change is needed. So that's why we've integrated the six programs. And I understand that the leader of the third party thinks that it is responsible to just say, don't change anything, just leave everything the way it is. That's not what we believe, Mr. Speaker. If there's a problem, Answer. we think we should solve it. More kids needing dental care, we think we should solve that. That's what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Final Speaker, I know that the Premier ignored the transparency and accountability piece of my question. Perhaps when she meets with Christy Clark this afternoon, a Liberal Premier to another Liberal Premier, she can encourage Ms. Ms. Clark to have uh, Peter Feist and Laura Miller come to her. Yeah, but since the legislature was recalled in the fall, Speaker, we've seen cuts to health care and kids, now dental care. We've seen child care spaces closed. We've seen insiders protected. We've seen cuts to schools. We've seen reports hidden from the public. We've seen an increase in the privatization of everything from hydro to health care. Is this the kind of cynicism and arrogance, Speaker, that we can expect from this Liberal government for the next three and a half years? Pretty much. Well, Mr. Speaker, just because that is the <laughs> narrative that's written down on the page that the leader of the third party has in front of her does not mean that that's what's happening, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that we are implementing the plan and the agenda that we ran on, Mr. Speaker. We said that we were going to make sure that we continue to deliver health care to people as they need it in their homes, where they need it, Mr. Speaker. We said we were going to tackle issues of poverty and making sure that more low-income kids have have access, access to dental care. That's part of a poverty reduction strategy, Mr. Speaker. And we said we were going to be open about the work that we were doing. That's why all of our mandate letters, both the ministers and the parliamentary assistance mandate letters, are available for everyone to know the work that is being done in this province, Mr. Speaker. And, and Mr. Speaker, I hope that as the leader of the third party sees the things that are happening, the changes that we are making that are benefiting people, that she will continue to, that she will support us in those changes, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Economic Development. Minister, 94 of the last 95 months, Ontario's unemployment rate has been higher than the national average. In particular, my riding of Elgin, Middlesex, London has seen their unemployment numbers continually rise since April. This past month, their unemployment rate rose from 7.5 to 7.8 per cent. You, Minister, have implemented a number of measures over the past three years, but obviously your plan is not working as unemployment numbers continue to escalate. My riding has lost over 6,000 manufacturing jobs under your government, and unemployment numbers continue to increase. Obviously, your ideas are not working. Minister, what is Plan B for jobs in my riding? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development and Infrastructure. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And yes, indeed, the job numbers on Friday weren't what we were hoping for, Mr. Speaker, and I had an opportunity to speak to that on Friday. But the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, these numbers fluctuate from month to month. And if you look at September numbers, Mr. Speaker, they were up 24,000. Not a peep from the opposition when our business community was, was creating 24,000 net jobs. When you look at October, Mr. Speaker, we're up 37,000 net new jobs. Not a peep from the member opposite, Mr. Speaker, when we're up 37,000 uh, new jobs. This past month, Mr. Speaker, yes, the numbers did go down, but since September, we're still up 30,000 net new jobs in this province. Mr. Speaker, that's good news. And still, Mr. Speaker, not not a positive peep from the member opposite on that news. Mr. Speaker, when our Premier came back from China, Answer. I'll talk about that in the supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No Thank you, Speaker. Minister, obviously you didn't listen to my question. The numbers have been going up, the unemployment rate, since April. It wasn't fluctuating. It was a continual steady trend upward. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe if you listen to the question, I'd get a good answer. Today Minister, the, the strategies you have initiated over the last three years have only transformed into election buying and job retention strategies as opposed to job creation funds. Your policies are failing my constituents. You've had three months in this legislature, Minister, to bring changes that would foster a business environment for investment and job growth. You again have failed to do so. Your current jobs program is that of high energy costs, job stifling regulations such as the College of Trades or mandatory WSIB for private contractors and mountains of red tape, all of which is detrimental to job growth for medium, small and large businesses. 
Minister, when will this government stop relying on old strategies that aren't working and implement policies to deal with the job losses in my riding? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, uh, in the month of uh, October, uh, manufacturing jobs up 32,900 in the province of Ontario. Last month, Mr. Speaker, overall not the best month for Ontario, manufacturing jobs still up 11,600 net new jobs. Again, not a peep from the member of the opposition on any of that positive information. In fact, Mr. Speaker, Speaker London has gained over 3,800 net new jobs in the last year. Again, Mr. Speaker, the member ignores that that good news information is community. Look, there are parts of this province, Mr. Speaker, that are struggling more than most. That's why we set up the Southwest Ontario Development Fund. Shamefully, Mr. Speaker, that member voted against that fund. $2.9 million, Mr. Speaker, has been invested in the London area, leveraging nearly $30 million, Mr. Speaker, in private sector investment in London, creating jobs in that community. We're creating jobs right across the province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member for Bramley Gore Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. During the holiday season, many charities give out gift cards to help clients afford food and gifts for their families. Last week, we uncovered the outrageous practice of Money Mart to, they, were, they were using to take advantage of the most vulnerable people in Ontario by paying out 50 cents on the dollar for gift cards. While we are encouraged, in, in fact, that Money Mart has announced that they are suspending this program, how will the government, how will the minister ensure that Money Mart doesn't resume this shameful practice once the spotlight is turned off? That's right. Minister of Government Services. Thank you, Speaker, and I uh, want to thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, and obviously, uh, this practice uh, we believe is uh, is uh, impacting vulnerable consumers in Ontario, and that's why we sent. Uh, uh, enforcement uh, folks uh, from our ministry to Hamilton to investigate. Uh, we reached out to Money Mart uh, immediately on hearing this information, and the program is now suspended, as the member has uh, has indicated. So I'm certainly uh, pleased with that. And uh, you know, Speaker, we have a strong record in our government of consumer protection and increasing and enhancing consumer protection measures. For, uh, for Ontarians, and uh, the, we will continue to review this matter and ensure that regulations are put in place. We have uh, proposed legislation coming in the spring following a, a very exhaustive consultation that has taken place uh, this spring prior to the election. And, sir. Speaker, and uh, we would likely have uh, more progress on that legislation had an election not been called, but we have uh, some very good recommendations coming forward to enhance legislation to protect consumers Thank on you. this issue. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the minister has had 11 years. This government has had 11 years to address this problem, and they have not addressed this problem. And, Minister, Mr. Speaker, it's not just Money Mart that has this predatory practice. Since we brought this issue to your attention, we've learned that other payday loan companies are offering a similar program. For example, Cash Corner is offering a very similar gift program to vulnerable Ontarians in the Niagara region. New Democrats have long called for sweeping and wholesale reform to put the brakes on this predatory industry, and this government has done nothing. Okay. Will this government follow the example set by the province, other provinces and finally commit to wholesale reform to regulate properly this predatory industry? Yeah. Minister. Speaker, well, the member knows that the comments that he's making are not completely accurate uh, because these are practices that evolve with these organizations as they continue to look for new ways to uh, increase their uh, financial betterment and at the expense often of vulnerable consumers. So we need to make sure and we need to be vigilant that we are continue to move forward with regulations and legislation that help to protect consumers in the province of Ontario. As soon as we became aware of this issue, Speaker, we acted. This process uh, and this activity is now stopped in the province of Ontario. We have changes coming. I am not aware of any jurisdiction in North America where there are resale, uh, uh, where there is legislation or regulations that uh, regulate the resale of gift cards uh, in in North America. But, and, however, uh, we obviously want to take all steps that we can to protect consumers. Thank you. New question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. 
Minister, in my riding of Kitchener Centre, I'm hearing from people who are having very uh, much trouble saving for their retirement. And there are many studies that do show that Ontarians simply are not saving enough for their retirement years. Our government has committed to improving the retirement income system. In the 2013 Ontario Economic Outlook and Fiscal Review, just to recap this three-part strategy, it focuses on people without workplace pension plans, people with self-directed retirement savings, and people with defined benefit plans. Minister, I understand that you are planning on introducing PRPP legislation this afternoon that is going to bolster our retirement pension strategy. Can you please further tell this House why it is that we need this plan? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Kitchener Centre for her question. Mr. Speaker, less than 35 percent of workers in Ontario have a workplace pension plan. Coverage for workers in the private sector is even lower, with only 28 percent having membership in a benefit plan. Mr. Speaker, these numbers are alarming, and that's why this afternoon I plan on introducing PRPP legislation, and I'm proud that this government is taking a balanced strategy to ensure Ontarians are better able to enjoy their retirement years. The PRPP will be part of our plan for a comprehensive retirement strategy for their security, and if passed, PRPP will allow Ontarians working for small to medium-sized businesses as well as self-employed to benefit from voluntary retirement savings tools at lower administration costs. Building strong retirement savings systems so Ontarians can have secure retirement future Answer. is a key pillar in our four-part plan to build Ontario up, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. It's very encouraging to hear that our government is committed to ensuring a strong and secure retirement income system to help people when they reach their retirement years. We know that in the 2014 budget, our government committed to introducing PRPP legislation this fall. But hasn't the federal government already introduced its own PRPP bill? They did this back in 2012. Minister, can you please tell us how the legislation that you plan on introducing this afternoon is going to compare with the federal legislation when passed? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, thank you to the member for Kitchener Centre for the supplementary question. The member from Kitchener Centre is correct. The P PRPPs were first introduced by the federal government in December of 2012 to provide individuals under federal jurisdictions with a new retirement savings tool. Legislations must now be passed by each province before PRPPs can be made available to individuals employed in provincial regulated sectors and self-employed individuals. Our government committed in the 2014 budget to introduce legislative framework for PRPP. It is an important part of our government's three-pronged strategy to enhance retirement savings in Ontario. And if passed, our province will join British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Nova Scotia in providing this voluntary Answer. retirement savings tool to ensure that people across this province can retire with dignity and security. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member for Kitchener, Canastova. Yes, uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Minister of Transportation. <clears throat> Speaker, in just the first month of this government's uh, winter road clearing plan for 2014-2015, we see that while we may have a new minister, he's working off the former minister's tired old script. He's employing the same old failed strategy of finding the heck out of contractors for traffic tie-ups and then walking away thinking the problem's fixed. Will the minister tell us how effective the over $3.2 million in fines handed to contractors last year have been in preventing road closures this year? Not very good, I bet. Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member opposite for that question. Uh, I, I believe that member knows, because I've said it many times in this House and outside of this House, uh, that road and highway safety is perhaps one of my most important. It is, in fact, Speaker, one of my most important responsibilities. Uh, when you look at the mandate that I've received from the Premier to deliver as Minister of Transportation, it's one of the reasons, Speaker, that we not that many weeks ago announced that we would be uh, releasing more equipment in Southern Ontario, 50 new pieces of equipment specifically, uh, to join with the 55 new pieces of equipment that were deployed last February in Northern Ontario. It's why we have new inspectors out on the ground. It's why we've moved swiftly 
uh, when there have been incidents uh, that have occurred so far this winter, Speaker. Uh, we will continue to work very closely with our uh, area maintenance contractors. Yes, sir. We'll continue to work closely with communities right across the province, and of course, Speaker, encourage drivers to drive according to the conditions of the road and to work with us as partners, as they always do, to ensure that our roads remain among, amongst the safest in North America. Supplementary. Slow down. Great advice. It's it's always the driver's fault. Always. Wait a minister. Speaker, just two weeks ago, the minister announced new fines for the Southern Ontario contractor for the QEW mess in late November. Then last week, another review, and surely fines to follow for a Highway 17 closure in Northern Ontario due to snow. This broken merry-go-round routine of winter road closure, government review, contractor fine may be filling government coffers, but it's done nothing to improve what's becoming a road clearing crisis. And yet we're still two weeks, in fact, from winter officially. Instead of just finding our winter maintenance partners, will the minister commit today to exercise his responsibility and work with the contractors to address problems ahead of time so that we can prevent them from occurring in the first place? Question. Good question. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member again for that follow-up question. I would say that since the, uh, the end of last winter, right through to the beginning of this winter, the Ministry of Transportation has worked very closely with our area maintenance contractors. And by and large, Speaker, throughout this winter season, this winter maintenance season so far, our contractors have performed well. Uh, of course, there have been circumstances, the member has uh, referenced a couple of them, uh, where it is possible, in one case likely, that a contractor fell short. Uh, or, or was out of compliance with contractual obligations. That's why the Ministry of Transportation, as per the contract, filed notices of non-compliance. But we continue to work closely with our partners, the contractors themselves. We encourage drivers, as I've said before, to drive according to the conditions of, road, of the road. And we, as the ministry, will continue to enforce the contracts to ensure that yes, our sir. partners are actually in compliance. Thanks very much, Speaker. Thank you. No question. The member for Tamiskam and Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources. Um, pardon my voice. Last Friday, residents of Iroquois Falls got a huge lump of coal for Christmas because Resolute Forest Products announced that they were closing the paper mill. And the paper mill is the pillar employer in that community, and not just in that community, in that whole region. Because the forest industry is highly integrated, so this is going to impact other mills, it's going to impact suppliers, it's going to impact right down to the grocery store. It's going to be huge. The last shift is just before Christmas. 23rd. But even a bigger issue, it was also announced that the heat for the mill will be shut off in February. So that, so the residents of Iroquois Falls, and they are a very resourceful people, Speaker, but they will only basically have a month, not even, to look for options and how to use that infrastructure. What we're asking today is will the government, will the minister stand with us and keep that question so the residents of Iroquois Falls and of Northern Ontario have a chance to look for options for their future. Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you, and I, I thank the member for the question. Uh, I got the call on Friday morning, about a half an hour before the press release uh, went out. Uh, clearly, let me just take a minute to uh, offer my concern and support and anguish uh, to the mayor, the new mayor, who I think, quite frankly, sounds like he's been hit by a truck, uh, Mayor O'Shea, who very difficult circumstances. Also talked to uh, Al Spacek uh, in his capacity with Phnom and have committed to meet with them as soon as we can or as soon as they are able. Uh, speaker, the, the member makes a good point. Uh, the integration of the forestry sector is also at play here. As difficult as this is for the community of Iroquois Falls, uh, this decision by Resolute obviously has implications for the sawmills in the region as well. Uh, if they lose their biggest customer for and the chips sir. and the residual that comes out of their sawmills, it has a big implication for them. So we're open and willing to discuss any options that may be available. I've already extended that to the Mayor and to Phnom as well. Thank you. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister for his response. But the crucial question is still. And in Northern Ontario, maybe everyone doesn't know this, but in Northern Ontario, once the frost sets in a building, it's ruined. So we've got a month, because basically when you shut it down before Christmas, you're not going to do much over Christmas. First of February, the heat's off. We've got basically a month. So we need, we need the government to stand. I'm 
impressed by what he's done so far, but we need the government to stand with the people of Northeast Ontario and make sure that that mill stays heated so we have the option to look at our future. Thank you. Minister, Speaker, um, this, this facility, as I understand it, is primarily and only a newsprint producing facility. Um, I'm not in a position to state with certainty exactly what's possible with this facility, but we'll, what I do know is uh, that the, this decision was based solely on the fact that newsprint demand over the last 10 or 15 years has basically been cut by 50, 60, 70 percent in North America or worldwide. I don't know how much opportunity there is to transfer this facility into some other capacity. What I do know is it has an impact on the greater region. I'm willing to listen. We're willing to talk. I can't make any commitments to you here today. But at the heart of this speaker is the fact that there is a significant and continues to be a declining demand for newsprint in the North American markets. That is what fundamentally underpinned the decision that was made by Resolute last week. And I would say it wasn't just in Ontario. And they sir? closed two machines in Quebec as well. Well, and I asked them, are you transferring capacity to another jurisdiction? No. They just removed the capacity from the system. There's no market for newsprint anymore or a significantly declining Thank market. you. Thank you. New question. The member for Halton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister, in my riding of Halton, we have a growing number of young families and an increasing number of young children who are approaching school age. There's no question, communication is a key skill for kids in school life. And we know that the sooner we address speech and language difficulties in a child's life, the more successful they tend to be. But when speech and language difficulties go undetected, they can have a devastating effect on the lives of children and youth. Minister, studies show us that about one in ten children need help developing speech and language skills. This means that a lot of young people in my riding could be facing an uphill battle. Minister, what steps has the Ministry of Children and Youth taken on this issue? Thank you. Minister of Children and Youth Services and Women's Issues. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the member from Halton for asking this very important question. Just last week, Speaker, we committed an additional $6.9 million over the next two years to Ontario's preschool speech and language program. Prior to this investment, the funding for the program totaled $36.2 million. So what this really means, Speaker, in terms of how it affects children, is that it will benefit 10,000 more children who need speech and language services. We're very proud of our achievements with the Ontario Preschool Speech and Language Program. Last year, it provided uh, services to more than 58,000 children with important communication and support services. So this will make it easier for children and their families to access services sooner and provide the resources they need to progress through their important developmental stages of life. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for highlighting how our government is working to make sure children who experience speech and language disorders get the services and the help they need in the critically early years. Now, I know members in my riding will be happy to know that the government will be providing millions of dollars in funding for Erin Oak Kids, an agency leader in the development of children's speech and language skills. This funding will help thousands of children get vital preschool speech and language therapy therapy services. Minister, I would be interested in knowing how these investments fit into our government's special needs strategy and how quickly these investments will, be begin, will begin to be seen. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Thank you again, Speaker. So, uh, Speaker. so earlier this year, our government announced our special needs strategy with the goal of improving the experience of outcomes for children with uh, special needs. And it will improve the services of children and their families by offering earlier identification, improved service planning, and coordination in the delivery of rehabilitation services. And what's really important, Speaker, is this funding will be allocated to the 31 preschool and language agencies in a very fair and transparent manner. And it's also important to note, Speaker, that every agency will re re receive funding to reduce their wait list. Absolutely, every agency. Half that money will flow this fiscal, which goes until March, and uh, families will be able to start benefiting sooner from this funding and almost immediately. So I look forward to working together with a common goal that 
as an Ontario where every child and youth succeeds. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member for Lanark, Front and Lanark, Lanark Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, my federal counterpart, Scott Reed, had donated defibrillators to our local police forces a few years back. However, when the OPP took over the Perth Police in April of last year, the OPP removed this life-saving equipment from their police cars. For three months, I've asked for a response from you, but to no avail. Minister, it's anywhere anyone's guess where these AEDs are now. But more importantly, why would the OPP, who are often the first responders to our highway accidents, remove these AEDs, and why can't you answer a simple question from a member of this legislature? Thank you. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And first of all, I want to take this opportunity to thank our OPP officers for the incredible work they do in our community 24-7, Speaker. They should be, they, we should be thanking them every single moment, given the, the work they do, putting themselves in, in dangerous situations in our communities. I have had a great opportunity, Speaker, as the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services, uh, to meet with a lot of OP, OPP officers, to visit detachments, and, and, and meet mayors who, uh, who benefit, their communities benefit from the services that the OPP uh, officers provide. And at every instance, Speaker, I have uh, residents and local leaders telling me how grateful they are to the OPP, uh, OPP services. Uh, speaker, I've had the opportunity to, uh, the member has raised the issue and I've assured the, the member opposite Answer. that we're looking into this, this matter and once I have a more fulsome information available, uh, I will be uh, sitting down with him and relaying that to him. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the minister. Minister, for three months now, I've called your office, I've sent you letters, I've spoken with you in this house. Where are these AEDs? And Minister, please explain to me and everybody in this House why the logic behind your policy that removes defibrillators from our police services. Minister, that what you just did, that response was atrocious. I've got a simple question to you. Where are the AEDs, and why do you have such a ridiculous policy that takes out AEDs out of OPP cruisers? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I think the member opposite very much recognizes, and I'm sure everybody in this House will expect that when it comes to decisions like what equipment to use and how to use them, that is not a political decision, Speaker. That is a decision that is made by the Ontario Provincial Police, as it should be, Speaker. That is not a decision that we, the non-experts in matters relating to policing, should be making. As I have given my commitment, Speaker, to the member opposite, as my my, uh, my office has been working with the member opposite. We are uh, looking into the matter, and as soon as we have that information available, Speaker, we will share uh, with the member, and I will even take his advice in, into account. But, Speaker, when again, when it comes to matter of safety and security of our communities, I will listen to our police service. I will listen to OPP and, sir, any single day uh, versus this member opposite. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member for Niagara Falls. Mr. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. The auto industry jobs are vital to Ontario. Economists are telling us that for every one job in a major auto assembly plant, there are 10 spin-off jobs that depend on it. Auto sales are strong, but there are worries about more auto plants leaving Ontario as the Canadian Manufacturing Footprint Commitment signed in 2009 is coming to an end. I'm surprised to see the Conservatives talking about this. They were clear in 2009, let GM fail and let the jobs leave Ontario. Without an auto strategy, the Liberals will be putting manufacturing jobs at risk the exact same way the PCs wanted back then. Will this government, will this government commit to a unified and integrated auto strategy for Question. this province that will protect our manufacturing sector and keep good paying jobs here in Ontario? 
places like Oshawa, St. Catharines, Niagara, you. Windsor, and Ingersoll. Premier. Minister of Economic Development, Employment, and Infrastructure. Minister of Economic Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for his passion for the auto sector. It's great to see that coming from the NDP. It's great to see it coming from the member. Because, to be frank, Mr. Speaker, just, uh, just a, a number of weeks ago, we announced a very significant investment in Alliston, uh, $857 million investment by Honda to support 4,000 jobs and tens of thousands of, uh, of other jobs, uh, supply chain jobs, uh, with an investment from the province of $85.7 million. And, Mr. Speaker, the, the view from the NDP was lukewarm at best. So, if your position is that you support the investments we've made in all, we've invested, Mr. Speaker, $800 million over the last uh, 10 years in the sector to accrue $10 billion of investment from the private sector in Ontario's auto sector. If you support those investments, Mr. Speaker, we're yes, really sir. pleased to have your support. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Minister, you might not know that, but I participated in the 2009 footprint agreement, so I absolutely have passion for the auto sector. And you can tell that we've lost jobs in the truck plant, we've lost jobs in transmission, we've lost jobs in the components plant. The footprint is important. We have so many advantages here in Ontario that manufacturers look to. Our low Canadian dollar, our universal medical system, our highly educated and skilled workforce. General Motors is committed to keeping 16 per cent of its North American manufacturing here in Canada with the agreement signed in 2009. It is ending in 2016. What we need now is a promise from this Liberal government that they will support an extension, support an extension of the Canadian manufacturing footprint commitment with a comprehensive, sensible and unified auto plan. We can protect thousands, thousands of Question. manufacturing jobs and pensions, just as important, pensions here in Ontario. Can we expect this government to do just that? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development. Mr. Speaker, the member can expect this government to do what we've been doing, Mr. Speaker, and that's to keep working with our auto sector partners, making very significant investments in the auto sector. $800 million, Mr. Speaker, we've invested over the last 10 years to accrue $10 billion of private sector investment. That's, that's the biggest commitment, Mr. Speaker, any government has ever made to the auto sector. We'll continue to work with our auto partners. We'll continue to work hard to continue to grow, maintain and grow that footprint that the member talks about. I welcome his passion, Mr. Speaker. I hope that the NDP's words are matched by their actions as they support the investments that we have made and will continue to make in the auto sector in this province. Thank you. Your question, the member for Davenport. We merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. It's the exceptional achievement of dedicated professionals and volunteers in the field of victim services in Ontario with your Victim Services Awards of Distinction. These services are essential to victims of crime. The services include counselling, referrals and financial support, which all work to decrease the trauma victims experience. My riding of Davenport has a number of shining examples of organizations that provide these crucial services. The West Neighbourhood House provides counselling services for women and children who are experiencing or have experienced abusive relationships. These counselors work to help victims make positive changes in their own lives. The individuals who do work in this field should be proud of what they do, and I feel they should be publicly recognized. Speaker, Question. can the Attorney General please share more information about these awards and inform this House who would be eligible for a Victim Services Award of Distinction? The Attorney General. First of all, let me say thank you to the member from Davenport for this very important question. The Victim Service Award of Distinction were established in 2006 to recognize the high-quality services and support that people and organizations provide to victims of crime on a daily basis throughout the province. So the award were created to recognize the great work of individuals who are personally impacted by crime and have raised the profile of victims issue in Ontario. Nominee must be an Ontario resident and may be individual victim of crime, their family members of, or, or other personally impacted by crime who have raised the profile of victim issue in Ontario, volunteer who offered, offer their time and personal resources 
to help victims, professional practitioner and Answer. paid victim services provider who have gone above and beyond their duty, program, group or organization that delivered innovative services to victims of crime. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mr. you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Attorney General for that response. I am pleased to hear that our government recognizes the exceptional achievement of dedicated professionals and volunteers in the field of victim services, as well as the good work of individual victims. I know of individuals in my constituency who have dedicated countless hours towards this honourable cause. I also strongly believe that once an individual goes through a program such as this, the individual, as well as the community, benefits. Speaker, can the Attorney General please tell this House how to nominate and submit an application for the Victim Services Awards. Thank you, Attorney General. Speaker, thank you for the member of Davenport for a very important question. If you'd like to sum submit a nomination, you need to complete a nomination form, and those nomination forms are available on my ministry's right. website. Your nomination form must be signed by either the nominee or a person authorized to uh, sign the, uh, the, the form. Detailed instructions that explain how to complete and submit a nomination are included on the form. Complete form needs to be mailed to the Attorney General Victim Service Award of Distinction, and the deadline is December 12th, this upcoming Friday. I encourage all members to consider submitting an application to recognize someone from their writing. The individuals who work and volunteer in this field are essential to the community and on behalf Answer. of my ministry and the Premier, I wanted to thank all of them who are helping to, uh, to those victims. Thank you very much. Thank you. New question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. In the past two years, there have been over 500 reports of pharmaceuticals that are either in short supply or completely unavailable. Why, Mr. Speaker, has this government made no apparent effort to ensure that our province's health care needs, specifically life-saving medication, are being met? Good question. Premier? Well, Mr. Speaker, um, in fact, what the uh, member opposite is alleging is not actually the case. In oh, fact, we have, worked, we have worked across the country with, uh, yeah. with our uh, colleague provinces, Mr. Speaker, That's to make true. sure that there is a rational Better process whereby uh, those, those drugs that come on, uh, on the market and, and are available elsewhere, Mr. Speaker, that they become available at a, at a cost that is uh, reasonable across the country, Mr. Speaker. So we've actually worked through the Council of the Federation of Premiers, through the, uh, the ministers of health, to make sure that there is a process that's nationwide and allows for the accessibility of uh, pharmaceuticals across the country, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our provincial counterparts in other provinces are already working cooperatively with the federal government to address this issue and produce concrete solutions. Why aren't we? We all heard from people with, uh, from the Epilepsy Foundation last week that they're having trouble finding their meds. The reality is this. Ontarians are simply not getting the best health care available, and their government is not looking at proactive solutions to get health care back on track and shortages under control. Oh. When will this government start taking Ontario's drug shortage problem seriously? No Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, we're actually working with the other provinces as well. We're working as yeah. part of that national we're process. So I'm not sure exactly where the, uh, the member opposite is getting her information because we are part of that pan-Canadian process, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, our Minister of Health was very much a part of, uh, of creating that panel. So, Mr. Speaker, we are working across the country. We have, uh, we have a good working relationship with, uh, with the uh, health ministers across the country, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to work to make sure that as drugs become available, as they are proven to be uh, efficacious, Mr. Speaker, and as we work with our colleagues across the country to make sure that they are available to people in Ontario. Thank you. The question. The, the member for uh, Windsor West. <laughs> hey, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. In September, I wrote the minister asking when the Southwest Detention Centre would accommodate male intermittent offenders. Now, four months later, I'm informed that for the time being, male intermittents from Windsor will continue to be sent to Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre because it is under capacity. 
In the time he took to answer my letter, one offender committed suicide and the facility was on lockdown for a week. Overcrowding at EMDC has been one of the triggers for all the problems there. Does the minister truly believe this facility is under capacity? Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank the member opposite uh, for, for asking this question. The, as the member alluded herself, she had, uh, had written to me uh, on, this, uh, on this issue, and I sent her a response back, letting her know that uh, uh, the uh, uh, Speaker, that we, uh, the Southwest Detention Center, uh, is, uh, uh, is going uh, through its process of, uh, of making sure that it gets to full capacity. But, Speaker, uh, as I explained to her before, and as I think members uh, uh, all members will recognize that uh, when you open a new detention center, you just don't open all the doors immediately and, and get it uh, get it filled up. It, it, it's a process, it's a protocol that uh, that puts in place to, uh, in a progressive way, uh, open uh, open the detention center. Primarily, Speaker, to ensure the health and safety of our correctional uh, staff. They work extremely hard, Speaker. And we need to make sure that they are comfortable with with the new facility, that they know all the all the protocols yes, uh, well. And, and as that process is undergoing, we'll make sure that Southwest Detention, detention Center uh, is uh, fully uh, 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 filled to its capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, perhaps the minister didn't understand the question. I asked the minister if he truly believes EMDC is under capacity, not Southwest Detention Center. Speaker, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. The minister thinks that throwing a mattress or two on the floor is a safe and effective way to increase capacity. He thinks that shuffling offenders out of EMDC to make room for int intermittent offenders doesn't cost the taxpayers anything. Perhaps the minister should head down to Toronto South today and attend their information picket after question period. Maybe then he will actually gain an understanding of our correctional facil facilities. Why won't the minister listen to corrections officers, inmates, and families and fix the deplorable state of corrections in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Uh I speak uh, uh, clearly. I mean, it's very clear what the, the member opposite is trying to do. Is she's trying to inject herself in a collective bargaining process, which is highly inappropriate. Speaker, I think the member opposite should should know better that there is a there is collective bargaining that is going on, and we should respect that that process. Uh, as speaker, our focus uh, as speaker is to make sure that we do transform our correctional system. The premier has given me a very strong mandate uh, in that regards, and we will do so, speaker, by working with our correctional staff, by working with our management. We are working with experts to make sure uh, that we are focused on rehabilitation and reintegration uh, of our inmates as they come back in, into our uh, community, also at the sa same time ensuring that our correctional facilities are, are, are safe places to work for our hardworking correctional staff. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. There be no deferred vote. This House is recessed until 1 p.m.